All right, everybody. Uh, thank you to the people who are joining us live. Uh, my name is Eric Maddox. I'm the host of the Latitude Adjustment Podcast, and this is one of our new offerings. This is the fourth in our series of live events, co-hosted by myself and my amazing colleague, Leila Mohaiber, who's also the president of the nonprofit that we work on together called Open Roads Media that focuses on similar issues, like uh, elevating underreported issues places. Um, and communities. So today uh, we are going to be focusing on the topic of what is also our most recent podcast episode, and that is uh, our friend Noor Kolmosh in Idlib, Syria. That's where he is right now. We're very honored to have had him as a guest on our last episode, which we invite you to go and check out. Uh, please make sure you listen to that interview as well, and uh, this will also be archived. So if you didn't get a chance to catch this whole episode, you want to share it with friends, there'll be a way to do that as well. Did I forget anything this time, Layla? Is that good? Did I say my name? I'm Eric Maddox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think you covered it. And if not, okay. we'll get to it during this live. Again, um, we're so grateful to be here with Noor, our esteemed guest, who's gifting us his time to talk about his personal experience in Syria. And as a humanitarian aid worker, um, it's an honor and a privilege to be in conversation with him. Um, my personal work is focused on uh, Palestinian refugees and uh, including refugees in Syria. But today we're gonna focus on Syrian Syrians and the experience there. Um, so I'm really grateful for everyone that's tuning in. We wanna welcome any of your questions uh, in the comments and we'll do our best to get to them, but uh, let's just jump right to it. Uh, Noor, can you give us a, a bit of an introduction of who you are for anyone who hasn't listened to the episode yet? Um, we'd like to know your name, uh, tell us about your work, where you are, your age. Uh, t tell the community a little bit about yourself, please. Hello everyone. Thank you so much, Eric and Leila for having me. Uh, my name is Noor uh, Al-Din Qurmush. Uh, of course, I'm from Syria, living in Idlib right now. I'm 23 years old. Um, I work with uh, Rahma Worldwide uh, as a humanitarian uh, worker, uh, humanitarian field worker, of course. Uh, basically, my work is focused on the refugee camps, in the refugee camps, IDF and uh, IDP, sorry. Uh, and of course, uh, within uh, some cities, just like Idlib and you know some cities around Idlib where they, we're targeting the people in need uh, precisely. Um, basically, um, that's me. And just to clarify for our audience, would you say IDPs, it's, uh, internally displaced peoples as opposed to refugees? Yes. Like people who have been displaced from their homes, but they have not left their country of origin. Exactly. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, so, I just want to check in with you, Noor. I mean, it's been a couple of weeks since we recorded. I think it's been a couple of weeks since we recorded our, our podcast interview. Yeah. How are you doing right now? Do you, I mean, and when I ask that, do you feel safe? What is the security situation like in the areas where you're living and working? Uh, basically, the security situation is the same, Eric. Nothing has changed a lot. But, you know, you, you keep uh, living in anticipation and fear. Um, while watching the news, while watching the uh, journalists who cover the uh, events inside Syria and outside Syria, while watching everything, uh, you keep living, living in anticipation. And it's strange, I know, but in hope, of course. Uh, you live in anticipation for something bad is going to happen to the area that you are living, in the small area that you are living. But you keep uh, living for a hope that things might get better. So, I mean, there's gonna be a few people who have not yet heard the podcast who might be listening to this. So we kind of, we might need to explain some things that they might not be aware of. Like, what are the dangers that you are thinking about? Like when you leave the house to go to work and when you're at work, what are the things that concern you? And I'm sure the things that worry your parents about you. Um, you're going to make me remember a lot of things right now. <laughs> I don't want to stress you too much. No, either. it's all right. It's all right. Um, you know, for the past nine years, you know, we had to work in a young age. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people might be surprised for, uh, how little this, uh, you know, Syrian children work to provide. And, uh, for me, it was 
almost the same, but I was a little bit older. And every time, you, you know, you have to work. Uh, you have to work. Every time I open the door, get out, um, my mom, my dad, my family know, and even my brothers when they go out, everybody knows that something might happen. And, you know, when we say might happen, that 60% chance that something might happen. Uh, it's either going to be uh, bar planes, it's either going to be just someone wanted to throw so some shells to this area. And you, you, can't, you can't anticipate anything, Eric, or Anzalea, you can't anticipate anything. You might go to, uh, for example, when I was in second year at college, we were uh, uh, doing our exams. We were, you know, for our exam for the second year. And bombs, warplanes were all over the place. Bombs were around the college. And, you know, uh, even the supervisor, supervisors and teachers and doctors they didn't know what to do. Uh, and, uh, of course, it, it's the same for us. You know, you might walk in the street and you sit on, you step on a cluster bomb and you die. So basically the thing that we anticipate and all Syrians anticipate when they get out of the house is death. Oh. No, that was deep. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I mean, there's no follow-up that I have to that, man. Yeah. I mean, I think that that just needs to kind of I think audience just needs to take that in. When you think about it, it's heavy. But when you live it, and when you live it for nine years, I don't want to say it becomes normal. Nothing becomes normal in these circumstances. But you you learn to live with it. You learn to live with it. Even currently, I you know, for my work, I have to travel to several areas within the liberated areas, and for me. I don't want to sound like that guy, but I feel fear whenever I leave the house. And for me, and not only for my life, of course, everybody scares for their lives. As I fear of my, my mom, if something happened to me, what's her reaction is going to be? My father, my brothers. Um, life uh, is not appreciated anymore, unfortunately, here, Eric. Life is just other element to be disposed, just like everything else. But at the same time, I know that, I mean, you're devoting your life right now and your work and your effort and other people along with you to preserving life, right? And to trying, um, to, and to, trying to create a life in difficult circumstances, right? When you, I don't want to sound too philosophical, you know, too deep, but that's what I what I feel personally, and a lot of my friends do that, feel that way. When you are so close and so far at the same time, because you never know how close you are to death, you want to do something in your life that people would remember you with. For example, um, after one, a lot of a lot of friends inside Syria, the same thing happened to them. Um, for example, I might die tomorrow, I might die next week, I might die next month. So I want to leave personally and all the humanitarians and most of the humanitarian workers inside Syria are thinking the same way. Uh, we're all going to die some someday, but it's different when you are preserving other people's life, lives to remember you after you're, you're long gone. I don't know, I can't explain it really, but it's something you feel that you have to do something to be remembered with and something that stays after you're gone because you never know over here when it's the time thank you for thank you for being willing to share what i know are difficult thoughts and experiences so open i really appreciate it Noor. yeah i echo eric's thanks Noor. um i hate that somebody who's 23 has to think about these things but i know it's the reality in which you're living and so i think it's really important that the people who are listening to this live um conversation now are aware of it um these are things that you don't kind of hear or learn when you're watching the news or when you're reading articles about the situation it's really important that we all remember um the human side of of conflict and of war and um we're just very grateful to you um to be willing to share that 
I wanted to kind of follow up to what we were talking about and talk about the need, the most urgent need right now for the people in Syria. Can you talk maybe about uh, the situation for food, shelter, um, the security situation, uh, education? I, I know that you work in these areas or you have colleagues that work in these areas. Can you give the people who are watching um, kind of a sense of the needs right now? Yes. Um, unfortunately, uh, the internal displaced people are, you know, I don't want to say doubled, but it is doubled. The, the numbers of the internal displaced people, uh, you know, has doubled, has have been doubled. Uh, because people are, were living at some parts of Idlib countryside, and those parts were controlled also by the regime forces currently, and they had to move. We are talking about more than one million people. They had to move to other places inside Idlib city and uh, its countryside. So refugee camps are all over the place. You can't go from area into another area without running into a refugee camp. And when, when I say refugee camp, that this refugee camp, camp at least holds um, approximately 1,000 people. Um, for food, uh, unfortunately, also, uh, the, the need is great, Leila. The need is great. We are talking about 4 million people living uh, under the poverty line of the, the UN. And, uh, and are you food, talking uh, about Syria or are you talking about Idlib province? Idlib, Idlib province. You know, uh, about Idlib province, this, the, 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 this area where the regime forces are trap, uh, is trapping uh, civilians. And when I say civilians, I say they are trapping civilians in that area and they can't go anywhere. They are trapped in this area. Uh, area, uh, there are not no not much work opportunities. Uh, uh, people can't get enough food for their children, even milk. The infants, a lot of infants, are suffering from the lack of feeding, uh, and some of them are dying because they need specific sorts of milk. You can't give them, you know, the, the uh, cow milk or other sorts of milk. Baby's milk is missing or is at high prices and of course the infrastructure is destroyed so uh, I've told Eric previously and for example we have not for example it's happening in reality refugee camps I know and I visited uh, it holds more than 1,000 people and it has only four bathrooms another refugee camps holds like 600 people and has three bathrooms the, the family uh, consists of six or seven people living in a tent that's only six by four wide and long. So I want to rep the people who are listening or who are aware of the Syrian situation, specifically in Idlib, to imagine with me a family consists of seven people living in a tent where they have to sleep eat, study, work, clean, wash, and do everything. The, and, and even if they wanted to have showers, to, to have a bath inside their tents, the other family members have to leave the tent so this, so this uh, boy or girl or man or woman finish the uh, shower and again and again. If, if a, a student, if a student, or if the refugee camp is lucky to have a school in it, they went, they go to the school in the refugee camp. And a lot of refugee camps don't have schools, so they have to walk at least, at least uh, in miles, six miles or five miles. That's the shortest, uh, you know, this is the shortest area that have school. For me, in my area, we have refugee camps away from the place I'm living, four kilometers. And if they, if they wanted to continue their studies, and when I, when I say if they wanted, I mean if they can afford. If the family can afford to support their children to continue their studies. Of course, when I say studies also, I'm sorry to explain so much because I want the people to understand. Uh, studies, I mean fifth grade, fourth grade, 
sixth sixth grade, not the high school or the uh, the college. I mean, the basic education. They can't have it. They have to move to other areas to get education and return in the same time. And if this this child wants to study, he has to study. He has to study in this tent where six people around him with no electricity, with no water. If he wants to drink a glass of water, he has to leave the tent to the nearest tank, the, the you know, um, the drinkable water uh, tank. He, have, he has to leave his tent in the middle of the night to drink the, some water. I mean, a lot of, if he wanted to wash his face, if he wanted to brush his teeth, he, he, he can't do that anymore. He can't do any of that anymore. I mean, it occurs to uh, me that all of this is happening in the context of coronavirus as well. I mean, the conditions you're describing as far as the possibility of social distancing, the possibilities of maintaining even basic hygiene, these all seem like just kind of dreams in that kind of context. And I, I, the other question I, I would have about that is access to medical services if somebody does get sick. So how, what, what, yeah, what, what is the access like to medical services, not just necessarily for somebody that might be impacted by coronavirus, but just for, for anything? Anything. If, uh, for example, if, if refugee camps, and uh, sorry to say, for example, but it is happening, not only if it's a refugee camp, for example, uh, a spider or a snake or a scorpion bit a child. He ha the father has to move the same area to, to the nearest health center, which, which may be 10 kilometers away or 15 kilometers away. Not all refugee camps have uh, medical points in them. Some have, some don't. So they just have to, for the simplest reasons, you know, if, this, if a snake, we are in summer, if a snake bites a child, he had the father has to move the child 15 kilometers and I would leave uh, the 15 kilometers period to the audience to imagine what would have done with the child. He might die. And for what? For a snake bite or a scorpion bite. And if a child, for example, has fever, the same thing, the father. And if the father is lucky, to find the car to transport his child. The, the, the common method over here at the refugee camps to move the child with bicycles, with motor bicycles. The, the, so that endangers the child even more. To, he's he's going to be exposed to wind and cold. Accidents might happen. So medical the, the, the access to the medical points currently at the refugee camps is nearly like 20% of the uh, refugee camps have access to medical points inside it and it's only initial medical uh, supplies not you know if you, if you want some uh, some prescriptions some medications you have to move to pharmacies where you have to buy the uh, the, the the medical or the you know the pills or whatever he is taking and if it was at high price, he can't have it. So thank you. Thank you for the very detailed description of a wide range of the challenges that you're dealing with. I, yeah, I know a lot of people might say that a lot of details, but you know, when I say a lot of details, that means I've been, I've been there, Eric. I've been displaced from my house at Aleppo and, um, I still remember a lot of things. Uh, I, for example, I used to, when I was in my house, I used to wake up early, wash my face, brush my teeth, brush my hair, dress well, and go to school or to university. And all Syrians do the same thing. And when you get out of your house, brushing your teeth is a luxury, becomes a luxury, Eric. Brushing your hair becomes a luxury. I still rem remember a lot of, dark times I've been through and believe me I've I've never seen anything in compared to other people so I want to 
also just remind the audience that there is, we've, Noel and I already had a conversation that uh, is our most recent podcast, and he goes into a lot of detail about what he's seen in the last nine years. Um, and there's going to be a lot of things that were discussed in that episode that we're just not going to get to today. So please, I would encourage you, if you, if you want to learn more about Noor's experiences, the things that not only that he's seeing now, but what he's been through over the past nine years, go to latitudeadjustmentpod.com forward slash podcast. And it's the most recent episode. Um, or you can just look for the podcast on Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, all the places where you normally download them to your phone, and you can just subscribe there as well. So just know that this is a this is a continuation of a conversation that was started on the audio form of the show, and uh, there's a lot that's contained in that as well. So I want to ask you a question. I'm, I mean, speaking of the the conversation that we already had, I want to ask you a question that I've already asked you because I think that your answer is an important one um, that people should hear, and that is that this war started when you were 15 years old. You've been through a lot. Nine years, man. At any point, did you think about leaving? Like a lot of people have left Syria. Why didn't you? Uh, that's. Um, I have thought about it, and every Syrian have thought about it. I don't want it. I don't want to sound too ideal. Every man of Syria has thought about it, but. When it comes to doing it, you know, something in your heart ache, you know, hurts, you know. Um, when you leave your hometown, when you leave your country, you, you feel that something is missing. And when I, something in your, deep in your heart that you're not complete, you're not living. Living in, in a place and suffering from a nine years of t this war gives you some some ideas, some thoughts and principles to hold on into. It gives you a lot of, uh, it might sound weird, it gives you a lot of spiritual ideas to hold on to in these times. Uh, basically, when you leave your hometown, you leave a part of yourself and bury it in the place that you have left. And, you know, safety is not guaranteed in anywhere in the world. You know, the whole world is getting crazy. And it's, it's a simple answer and yet so complicated. You know, it's your home, Eric. It's, it's no matter how hurt he sees, no matter how painful to live in these circumstances, but it's your home. It, it, it's your home. It's, it's just like leaving, leaving your mother or leaving your father or leaving uh, your child. You know, you, you always think about him. You always worry about him. You, you wish you could do, you save him from anything. And that's the, 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 the idea of the homeland. This is where I was raised. This is where I, I, I met, I, I've... This is where I first fell in love. This is where I first met my friends. This is where I first went to the university. This is where I first, uh, you know, this is where my, my brothers are living. This is where uh, this, I can't explain. I can't explain so much, but it's your home. I think you're explaining it fine, man. Yeah, you really explained it perfectly, Noor, and I understand that that love for your land and for the place where your ancestors come from. And um, I think we all yearn to have that feeling and to want to stay where we are. Nobody wants to leave. And um, I hope you're always safe um, where you are. I wanted to, uh, I'm sorry, go on. No, I'm just coughing. Oh, Saha. Um, yeah. So... I wanted to just kind of back up to a different question, back to the question we were asking about the situation um, with the work that you do uh, with Rahma worldwide, correct? Um, do you yes. spend a lot of time in these camps and are you there? How often are you there? Or are you hearing uh, reports from other colleagues? I'm just curious about that before I ask you my next question. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I visit. I, I, you know, I often visit, and a lot of times I visit the refugee camps myself. Basically, every time uh, there is a work, we head directly to the refugee camp, and you know, uh, uh, sometimes there are food baskets to distribute. Sometimes there are cleaning and hygiene baskets, and uh, you know, we are in the COVID nineteen. COVID nineteen, you know, twenty cases in the. Uh, Idlib province has been detected, have been detected. And, you know, a lot of procedures oh. were taken by Rahma Worldwide. And uh, it's our duty as volunteers to devote our times and our efforts to deliver this uh, basic needs and basic hygiene uh, needs to the uh, refugee camps. And of course, when you visit the refugee camps, you, ch- you try your best to protect the people and deliver the necessary aid for them. But sometimes, and this is this happens with all NGOs, not only us, all NGOs and all humanitarian workers, sometimes suffer the same. Uh, you know, one of my friends described a situation for me, and you know, I've seen it, and someone else has seen it, and other people has. Uh, you know, suffered from it. Uh, you you have you know you have ten baskets, ten food baskets, or one food basket, for example, and you have ten families, and you have only one food basket. You know, th- this is the choice the people inside Syria are suffering from, and you have to choose who gets this basket. And if you gave it to the, to a family, the other nine families will will suffer. For the next month and the next month the food baskets might not get in and just just like i previously mentioned work opportunities are not that much are, are no job work opportunities uh, inside a war zone of course we're living in a war zone so work opportunities are a golden ticket to the syrian uh, citizen and especially in idlib i'm describing in idlib province right now so we try our best to uh, do what we have to do. I understand. And obviously no person wants to um, rely on assistance from international organizations. They want to be able to earn these things themselves. And and I, I know sometimes there's misconceptions about people receiving humanitarian assistance and that there could be laziness. And I know that the situation in Syria is like, if people could work, they would work and people are doing the best that they can in the situation that they're forced to be in. Um, I'm so glad there's people like you there to help them. And then later on in this conversation, we'll ask you to explain how people can be supporting that. But um, thinking about outside of the camps, the last time that Eric and I went live here for Latitude Adjustment Podcast Live, we spoke with some uh, organizations that are based in Greece and in the Balkans, and they're assisting um, refugees over there, um, people that have fled. And I wanted to know, um, you know, they explained the situation there. I wanted to know what you have heard about the conditions of Syrians living in camps outside of Syria. Um, I have friends uh, who visited Camp Moria in Greece specifically. Uh, they are, of course, Greek friends and other Syrian friends. Uh, they, they describe the thing that they described is not different from the things over here, except except the difference that there are no bombs, there are no arrestings, no uh, warplanes. You know, you don't have to fear or live in anticipation for a warplane or an airstrike or a missile or anything or a cluster bombs. Uh, uh, from my perspectives and from the things that my friends told me, this is the only difference. I know that a lot of people are trying to help at the uh, refugee camp at uh, Camp Moria, but something must be done for them. They can't be stuck there forever. They are living in a, in, 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 in a miserable situation. And we, of course, as fellow Syrians, we don't wish to see our brothers and our uh, fellow uh, uh, citizens suffer just like we suffer. We want them to be safe. So if if people here died, someone else would hold the torch. Could, could I ask a follow-up to that also? 
because I think it's important to highlight that there are also a lot of Syrians in the neighboring countries, right? In Lebanon, in Jordan, to some extent, even in Iraq. Um, and where am I leaving out? Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey. <laughs> um, are you speaking to people who are, in, who are refugees in these countries as well? Have you heard about their conditions? Uh, in Turkey, yes. Uh, uh, in Lebanon, yes. But in Jordan and other places, uh, unfortunately, no. In Turkey, I know that uh, there are refugee camps. And in compared to Camp Moria, they are a lot better. The condition of the Syrians in Turkey is a lot better than Greece, you know, in Camp Moria. Mm. From the descriptions that, you know, some of my friends tell me. And of course, I have a friend in Lebanon who described me uh, the situation in Lebanon, and it's as terrible. Uh, it is as terrible. I've actually yeah. heard and met people who um, were Palestinian refugees from Syria, maybe living in and around Yarmouk camp and ended up in um, Lebanon or even in Gaza, in Gaza Strip, for anyone who's not an Arabic speaker. And uh, I heard that there was even a trend at some point of people going back to Syria, not necessarily because it was better, but because the situation uh, yes. in Lebanon was so bad that they'd at least rather be in their home country and kind of ride it out from there, hoping that it might get better. They'd rather be in their homeland and they have that same, of course, connection to home like you talked about earlier. In addition, the things you have mentioned, a lot of them are risking themselves to be captured by the regime forces and not living in Lebanon. Yeah. So, so would, when you were saying going back, did you mean Palestinians in Syria who went back to Palestine, or do you mean Syrian no, refugees who Syrians returned to Syria? Refugees who, Syrian refugees who live in Lebanon and they uh, want to get back to Syria. And you, yeah, you spoke and I was also. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. First, Noor, if you want to answer Eric's question about whether or not you've spoken to those people that have fled back from Lebanon. No, I have never met anyone, anybody, but a lot of reports and. Some of my friends told me a lot of people have returned from Lebanon to uh, Syria. And some of them uh, reached Idlib. Wow. I think it depends on the borders, right? There were times when um, there was more or less security on the borders. And depending on, you know, it's been nine years, like you said, so things yes. changed over that time. Um, but I also heard that a lot of people, of course, they flee without documents and papers because they don't think that they're, Maybe, maybe their house was bombed or maybe wherever they were, like those things got destroyed or maybe people didn't think that they would need all this stuff. They left for, you know, safety, but thinking they're going to go back. And then sometimes you get trapped in a place where, you know, you're undocumented and then it becomes even more challenging. But I don't want to stay on that topic. I, I think it's important for people who are um, watching us are thinking about these things. I wanted to point out that there are people listening from Virginia Oregon, from Albuquerque, New Mexico. You have uh, listeners more from around the world and across the United States. And um, before we actually had this conversation, I asked people on my Facebook to share uh, things that they would want to say to people from Syria. Uh, a lot of them said that they wanted to remind you that Americans do care and that they, they have hope and they're inspired by your hope and I hope people continue in the comments to share messages with Noor. Noor has shared this video with his own uh, Facebook as well so uh, his friends and family can see your comments so please keep engaging with us through this conversation and I'm going to pass the mic. I forgot I forgot where my mute button was. There. Sorry. <laughs> um, so we touched on this a bit already Noor but it might be worth uh, revisiting it. What impact are you seeing coronavirus having on the situation in Idlib? And how is it impacting you, by the way, personally, your family? Um, first of all, uh, coronavirus has reached, a lot of people don't believe that coronavirus has reached uh, Idlib province and the Liberty Day, but it has reached and uh, 20 cases are confirmed with uh, two uh, healed cases in uh, the province uh, until this moment. Uh, of course, the people are doing their best to, you know, to protect themselves and their families and their communities. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of, uh, of the Syrian people inside the province are showing 
uh, a perfect awareness that I personally did not uh, expect from a society who was living in nine years of war. Uh, people are trying their best to provide medical masks. Uh, people are trying their best to provide util utilizations and cleaning materials, although they are very expensive. Uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to have a medical max mask at some areas, you have to buy them. Uh, for me, in my house, uh, we have taken uh, procedures uh, because me and my brothers and my family, of course, we uh, we have to leave the house. Uh, you know, you can't expect a lot. Of, I've heard a lot of people talking uh, that you are not responsible if you do not did not quarantine yourself and stay home. Uh, it's different out here to quarantine yourself and to stay home because it's simple. You have to work. It's just that simple. There are no official official government to give to support you or to give you a stable monthly amount of food or, or uh, money. So you have to work to provide. You have to work to, uh, to buy cleaning materials and utilizations and medical masks. Uh, and of course, uh, we are trying our best to uh, push this pandemic away. And we hope we can make it. Yeah, I hope so too. I hope you always stay safe, like I said before. Um, Nora, shifting gears a little bit, I want to know what you think uh, the international community can be doing to ease the suffering of the Syrian people. We have uh, listeners from all around the world, including the U.S., but what are some ways that you wish that people would take action? The people. You mean the people, not the international community. Oh, you know, you could speak about both if you'd like. It could be from the people or on a governmental level. I, I'd like for you to share what it is that you think should be happening. Um, Layla, the people have the power to do everything and everything literally. They have the power to choose their governments. They have the power uh, either to die for principles or to live under injustice. I believe that the people all over the world is united in somehow this pandemic i know it's a negative things and it's the worst thing happened for the last decade but it has shown that we are all connected somehow right now the whole world is feeling each other's pain all countries are feeling each other's pain what i ask from the people the free people around the world is to see other people just like this pandemic. They, they feel our pain just like we feel their pain. I just want the whole people to, if they couldn't help in material thing, it's the helping is not only necessary with material things. Of course, it helps a lot to feed a family or to provide for a family. But if you could not do that, at least with your voice, at least with your heart. The people are the power of the world. That's what, what I believe, and this is my principle, that all people, regardless everything, and I mean regardless every political background or anything else, people are humans. Humanity connects us and unites us against the injustice. Nobody will accept the injustice to happen to anyone in the world. I don't wish anyone in the world to suffer just like we did. And regarding to the international community, um, of course we demand serious methods to be acted and to, to be performed against this regime to stop the killing of the innocent people. There's something that you said at the beginning, your answer that struck me, and that's like this connectivity that people might be feeling as a result of the pandemic. And I mean, first of all, it shouldn't take a global pandemic for us to see how we're all connected. Um, but if, if that is serving some good and it wakes us up and helps us to realize that, look, like our health is all interconnected, 
that maybe we can begin to take the next step of realizing that there's other things that connect us as well, you know, like our access to justice um, and security and basic human needs. These are all things that every human being requires. And some of us might be in more privileged positions than others with respect to those basic needs, but we all need to maintain them in some way or another. And if we're able to justify to ourselves ignoring them in one context, there's no reason why we can't be ignored later. Um, so I think that I'm, I'm hoping that one of the things that comes out of the pandemic and this maybe awakening that people are having, realizing, hey, wait a minute, all of our fates really are kind of entwined here. If people aren't looking after things like their borders or the public health of their communities, that's, gonna, um, that's going to impact us. And by borders, I don't mean clamping down on them. I mean, taking responsibility for the people who live inside them um, and uh, providing justice and access to services. So maybe there's a possibility that this can wake people up to recognizing that, hey, there's a, there's a lot of suffering that's been going on for a lot longer than this pandemic that we've been content to ignore. And uh, maybe this is our wake up call. I don't know. That's just, that's just my commentary. I totally agree, Eric. And for me personally, I have never thought in my life I would have friends from all over the world. And I say friends, very close uh, friends. I have a lot of friends from the U.S. I have a lot of friends who are Americans and a lot of friends from Germany. I have friends from France. I've, I even have friends from Japan. And they're all aware of the uh, Syrian revolution and they are all supporting the uh, Syrian revolution. Um, even one of my uh, Japanese friends has inspired me to learn Japanese and as the uh, Syrian revolution inspired him uh, in his master degree, where he, uh, he did a master degree on the situation in Syria and the revolutions in Syria, and he got a degree in it. And I was so honored to be mentioned in his degree. Um, I mean, uh, just like you've, you've, you've said, the whole world is connected and is connecting in somehow. Just like I said, I have never thought in a moment in my life I would uh, stand here and talk, talk to you or talk to uh, Layla or have friends from the U.S. or to be op wildly open to the world. And that's how uh, all our messages and uh, goals in life should be. To, be to, to help in connecting all the people together because eventually borders are just lines were drawn humanity humanity unites us Lord, i'm so inspired by him i'm sorry i just want to tell him thank you i, I and i i if i can i yeah you've inspired me to 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 speak a little bit more on something that you said that is that we do share these connections and we are living in a time where we can make them, where we can do like what we're doing right now, right? And for people who are feeling isolated or feeling like they're not connected to, I don't know, uh, to, to the rest of the world or lacking some sense of purpose in their lives, keep in mind that there, there's an opportunity to connect to so many issues and to people who need your help. Um, and I hope that that's something that we're that we're that we're accomplishing in some small way by even doing these events, you know, and, and that it doesn't just stop with people watching what we're talking about, but that they see this as like inspiration for them to go out and do something similar. You know, it shouldn't stop here. Uh, and if people are curious and want to find a way to to make these connections on their own, we are here to help facilitate that in, in whatever way we can. I'm sure I speak for Layla and you do. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. I think I've run my mouth enough. Um, Noor, people in the car, I know you can't see the comments right now, but the people are really inspired by you and they're thanking you for reminding them how uh, empathy is so important. They're saying amen or I mean in Arabic and yes with exclamation points because your message really resonates so well with people. Like I feel so inspired by you and I hope that your, your voice carries all around the world and people continue to share this message because um, 
you're just a wonderful, wonderful human being. And I hope you consider Eric and I to be your friends in that list of friends. Of we're, we're really humbled to be your friend. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah um, you're stuck with us. Be an honor. Yeah. <laughs> you're stuck, yeah, you're stuck with us. Um, but, you know, my nickname with my friends is The Connector, and, and I truly believe in, in that connecting people, connecting ideas, connecting projects is what's going to help us um, advance our causes. Um, this, this is our humble effort, like Eric said, to do that. Um, and we also have a number of other projects that we work on together. Nor I want you to be able to share, even after the show, things that you're working on that you want support from, um, that you wish other people would engage in. I hope you know that this is a community that is here for you and to help uplift um, your voice and your initiatives. And um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about your own personal community. Um, you know, you talked about your friends around the world, but maybe also your community in Idlib. Like, what do you love about them? And, and what gives you hope, really, um, in terms of community? I know you kind of spoke about that already, but if there's anything else you want to add about your, your own neighbors and friends and family. Uh, you, you, remind, you reminded me of a situation that happened to me a few days ago. I was in Idlib City, and uh, I went to, into the store. I wanted to buy a bottle of water. The, the shop owner was very kind and was his kindness wanted me wanted you know his kindness wondered me and and told me to wonder where is he from so I just sat and talked to him He's, he was from eastern Ghouta he besieged Ghouta he uh, uh, left uh, with the green buses if you have heard of them they were forcibly uh, displaced from uh, Ghouta and he came to Idlib. And he was just describing that we have never thought we would leave Eastern Ghouta. And when, whenever he uh, talks about his days in Eastern, he was smiling and he was full of joy. And I was, I, I mean, man, he, he suffered way more than I did. He was besieged uh, for a longer time than I have. Uh, a lot of things he w could not be able to achieve. And he just, you know, answered with so simple words, but with huge meanings. He said, hey, man, it's the most important that you, you realize from the inside of yourself that you are free, that nobody can tell you what to believe and what to do and how to do it and when to do it. Nobody can force you to do the wrong things. Even if you died for that cause, it would be something beautiful. You just have to spread love. Even that, and this is, this is my beliefs for, for more than six years ago. Even though I have faced a lot of hatred, I have faced a lot of pain, a lot of attacks from other people. A lot of people accused us that you are liars that and, and, and most of those people when they knew the truth they apologized immediately um our my message and a, most of the all of syrians message that love is what gives us hope the human being is made of love he can't neglect love love is the father of all emotions and all principles. If you can't love your country, you can't defend. If you can't love your friends, you can't protect them. If you can't love your family, you can't work for them. If you can't love people, you can't live with them. Uh, love gives me hope, actually. I love that. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, I have, we, I, we actually went through our list of questions because like in our podcast interview, you're very efficient. <laughs> and so I have a couple of additional questions that, that I'd like to ask too. Um, and also I would like to, I'd like to remind our, the people who are, who are listening right now, of course, like you're, you're welcome to pose your own questions as well. But, uh, one of the additional questions I'd like to ask you is 
how has your work, um, whether it's what you're doing now, by the way, or the work that you were doing, because when we talked, you told me you started out just helping people load up trucks, like when you were still like uh, 15, 16 years old, I think, like you've had different jobs over the years. How has, how has work changed you? How has the work that you've done changed you? What has uh, it shown you? A lot of memories. Uh, if you if you remember when you asked me that question, I, I was a little bit emotional, so I'm warning you right now. It's fine, and you don't have to answer um, it, but you're welcome. Yeah, I would love to answer it because I want the people know. Uh, nothing is impossible in this life, even though you're living in the darkest moments. When I came uh, from Aleppo city, I was uh, in the eleventh grade. And I come from a family, my father uh, has worked a lot to teach us. Uh, my older, uh, my eldest brother was a second year student in uh, mechanical engineering, uh, electronic engineering, I'm sorry. And my other, P, uh, uh, my other uh, brother was studying uh, history and my other brother was studying uh, in education uh, college. Uh, and I was, and I'm the youngest, so I was in the eleventh grade. And the high school exams, I'm sure Laila knows, and I explained to you, the high school exams are the 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 red line in our lives, where you get to college or you spend the rest of your life without education. So I studied and studied and studied. Of course, a lot of things were we were displaced two times. And when the exams uh, are so near, and I didn't know I couldn't go to the regime areas. There was no uh, exams over here because the whole area was getting bombed. So there was no room for the people who are living in the liberated areas to uh, perform exams, to do exams. So uh, I woke up at 5 a.m. I still remember, and I was studying when my father came uh, of course, I don't have. I didn't have room back then. We, uh, me and my family were. Uh, me and my family are ten people. We used to live in two rooms, because uh, we left our home in Aleppo, and we lived in two rooms for one year. Um, my father came to me, and uh, he put his hands on my shoulder, and he told me, "I can't let you go." to the regime areas. Um, it was a shock to me to know that all the things I've done just, you know, just gone. So uh, I went to live with my grand, uh, uh, with my grandmother uh, just a few, for a few weeks. I, I just wanted to clear my mind. Um, I still remember getting out of the house at 6 a.m. Of course, you have to leave the house at a very early hour to, to provide bread. Um, I left the house and I saw the bus taking all my colleagues, uh, boys and girls, and going to do their exams. And I was the only student in my area that could not go. And I, and, and I was one of the smartest. I don't want to talk about myself, but I love studying. Um, it was a moment that I thought of committing suicide. It was a moment that I felt everything has ended. There's no need for me to live. No, no education, no life, nowhere to go, no jobs, nothing to do in your life. So... My aunt gave me a book and she told me to read it. It's a novel. So I read it and that's when I started reading. I started getting books from here and there. Of course, no bookstores. Uh, eventually, I spent all my time reading novels and other books. So eventually, I had to work. Um <laughs> I worked as, uh, you know, uh, cars, trucks, 
who would load merchant and goods requires people to load and unload the and i'm skinny i can't carry so much so i had to do it i can't ask my family to give me money because i can't you know they would give me they would won't, they wouldn't tell me no but i can't put them in this situation so i had to provide my own needs um i used to work for 500 syrian pounds uh, per week that's two dollars at uh, previous time currency two dollars per week um after that uh, one of the shop owners uh, saw me and offered me to work in his shop and again i worked as a shop owner uh, at the a shop uh, you know just helping in the shop and after, I didn't I didn't mention uh, things in the previous interview. I worked as uh, in land. Uh, I, it, it's it's kind of ironic when I remember because I'm I'm so skinny and I'm not don't have that strength. But you have to do it. I worked in land, uh, in olive trees, in orange trees. After that, uh, the high school exams opened. And I did the exam and I passed the high school. But there was another obstacle in the way. See, nothing easy comes in life. Uh, I could not go to the university because, again, no universities in the liberated areas. You have to go to the regime areas where you would be immediately arrested. And arrested means killed. Um, so, again, the same situation happened to me i don't know why god put me in that situation but now i know uh, the same situation i saw all my friends getting into that bus and going to the university and again i was the only student that could not go to the university and i wanted all my life to study english literature i love english literature um I, I did not care so much about it because I knew at some point I have to let go of, you know, all the childish dreams and deal with the reality. And then six months after that, the university opened in Idlib and I uh, registered there. And currently I'm going to graduate, inshallah. Wow, that's wonderful. <laughs> it's, it's a long story, I know, but that point in my life has taught me a lot of things. Yeah, it's a long story and it's been a longer journey, man. <laughs> and I said it in our interview and I say it again, like, Mabruk. Thank you, so much. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Elena. I would pick you as my teacher, by the way, Noor, any day. <laughs> if you wanted to become a teacher, you're excellent. <laughs> so we're, we're getting uh, yeah. close... Sorry, you had something you no. wanted to add? Okay. No, no. So we're getting kind of towards the end of our hour. Um, and I want to make sure I, I mention a couple of things really quick. Um, one, for the people who are joining us now, who might be watching this after it's been recorded, um, this, while we covered a lot in this discussion, there's a lot that we also covered in our podcast. This is a continuation of an earlier conversation that I had with Noor on the audio podcast. And there is a lot that we discussed in that about what he's seen over the past nine years, including some very difficult stories, uh, just to hear. That I, so I strongly encourage you, you have not heard everything that we've discussed today, although we did cover a lot. Go back, listen to that podcast. Uh, the link is in the comments, but also I'll just tell you now, you can go to latitudeadjustmentpod.com forward slash podcast. Uh, also, if you want to continue the conversation, uh, about this and other episodes, you can find us on Facebook. There's a there's a group called Latitude Adjustment Conversation Group on Facebook, and then we're on most social media platforms. So you can find us at, at Latitude Podcast on Twitter. Although I need to get better about using that. And then there's Latitude <laughs> Latitude Adjustment Podcast uh, on Instagram, and then YouTube. Facebook. And and yeah, I will be posting. I'm archiving a lot of this stuff also on our website. So if you don't, if you want to share this off of Facebook, uh, then you can go to the website also for all the previous and also this live episode, and that's at 
latitude adjustment pod.com forward slash live. <laughs> so hard to remember. All right. Um, so I think I covered the technical stuff. Yeah, somebody asked about YouTube. Yes, just go to our go to the go to the website and you can find all of that, the links to the YouTube stuff. Um, latitude adjustment pod.com forward slash podcast. Laura, thank you. Latitude adjustment pod.com forward slash podcast. So yeah, that's that's enough of my promotional stuff. I want to just check in with the two people who are here with me again briefly and to say, uh, Layla, thank you for encouraging me to do these events um, and to get out of my comfort zone. I know that you say you're getting out of your comfort zone participating in the show, but but this is a different format for me. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for being a part of it, for encouraging me to do this and for like always pushing me in the seven years that I've known you. I really appreciate it. And N Noor, um, thank you for making the time. And what I know is, uh, incredibly stressful, difficult circumstances, and you are devoting yourself fully to helping to make life easier for a lot of other people. And you deserve to be acknowledged for that. When you have, it would be full-time work for you, I think, just to look after your own needs. Thank you for making time to speak to us, to share your own stories, and to educate the public about the conditions of your community and what they can do to help as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric, for having me, and thank you, Leila. Yes, I echo everything Eric said. And Nora, you are so inspiring. And the work you do is so important. I always, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so lucky to meet someone like you who's so articulate and uh, so open. And I hope everyone else felt just as moved by Nora's um, testimony and, and his experiences. And maybe we'll have you on again, because I think people would like to hear more from you, Nora. It's That'd be honest. Honest. Yeah, I think we should share that sentiment. So I think just a reminder, Noor, we'll, we'll talk to you uh, after we stop the, the live broadcast. But uh, is there anything else, Layla? Are we good? Oh, yeah. I have a question. <laughs> Let's okay. see. One last question for you, Noor. There's a picture of you that we used as part of the promotions. I'm trying to uh, show it on the screen. Give me one second. Let's see if it will work. Oh, it's not giving me permission. But if you saw the promotional image, it's a picture of Noor with a group of beautiful ballerina dancers. And I want to know what the story is yeah, behind, the story. This, behind this picture. <laughs> <laughs> Who are these girls? <laughs> um, this picture is one years old. Um, I was uh, at a child protection uh, committee. Um, I love children, all children. And those children were just, those beautiful princesses were just amazing. And they were just dancing around. And I offered that. I want to dance too. You need a prince. So you are all princesses and you need a prince. <laughs> so sweet. I danced with them. There's a video of me dancing with them. I don't know if it's, it's there anymore. But eventually they, everyone wanted to get a photo with their prince. So... <laughs> I was in the middle of all these beautiful princesses. That's the best story ever. <laughs> On that note, Eric, if you want to end our, our show today. I just want to say thank you to my co-host, Leila Mokhaiber. Uh, thank you to Noor, our guest, both uh, on this live episode and also on the most recent uh, edition of the audio podcast. And thank you to all of you who I can't see who are watching this live right now and who might be watching this as a recorded uh, or archived episode. Uh, thank you for making the time to learn and to share about what's happening in, uh, in Idlib and in Syria. Mm. Thank All you. Right.